want to greet all of you who are watching online, and a special greeting also to those of you in our campuses today, in Waterbury, in New Milford, and in the Valley, in our Derby campus. My name's Brian. Uh, for those of you who might be new, uh, first, we're so thankful that you've joined us today, and I'm one of the lead pastors, and it's a great opportunity and privilege to be able to share God's Word with you today. You know, we've been in this season that we started called On the Other Side of Yes, and the challenge for us in this year is to say yes to the Lord whenever he calls. See, I truly believe that when we say yes to the Lord on the other side of that yes, that's where a thriving relationship with the Lord begins. When we say yes to the Lord on the other side of that yes, that's where mountains move, where we get to see the kingdom of God impacted. Not our kingdoms, but the kingdom of God. What an invitation from the Lord when he calls us that if we say yes, we get to be a part of building his kingdom. And so we've been going through uh, this series that we're calling On the Other Side of Yes, and there are three parts to this. The first part was saying yes to his promises, the promises of God, which is a great place to start. He's given us wonderful promises, wonderful promises. Do you know that you are loved? Do you know that you have a purpose? Do you know that you are not alone? Praise God that he's given us these wonderful promises. The second section which we've begun is that we want to say yes to devotion. We want to be a committed people. We want to be a people who are devoted wholeheartedly to the Lord. And so this means saying yes to the things that he's called us to. I'm so thankful that we have the word of God. I'm so thankful that we have the word of God. This word of God that's tried and tested, that we can have confidence in it because of things like textual criticism and historical documents and manuscripts that have been found over the years and lined up and seen how they, 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 they match each other perfectly. But, but even more than that, because when applied, the word of God changes our life. And so how do I know that this word is true is because to, to the best of my ability, I've applied it to my life and I've seen transformation. And I've seen the word of God, when applied into other people's lives, change and transform their life. Because it's true. It leads us to the truth. And, and in this word, the Lord calls us to be devoted to, to many different things. And there are these tools to, to build our faith, to grow in our intimacy with the Lord. And so we've spent time talking about saying yes to prayer, saying yes to fasting, saying yes to forgiveness, saying yes to peacemaking. And today we're going to talk about two more. And remember, these are just tools that when we say yes to these things, it builds our faith, it builds our relationship with the Lord, it, it grows our intimacy with him. And today, we're going to talk about two things that are really outward things. We're going to say yes to compassion, and we're going to say yes to unity. And again, I just think that the Lord has gone ahead of us, and he's, he's giving us these, these topics and, and this word today that's completely relevant for us. You see, we're called as the body of Christ to be compassionate people and to be united together. And so we need to say yes to these two things. Um, so what I want to do today is I actually want to do three things. The first is I want to talk about saying yes to compassion. The second thing is I want to talk about saying yes to unity. And the third is, as one of your lead pastors, I want to talk to us about how we should approach and just give some, some words of counsel and guidance as we approach the election. <laughs> So now you're going to stay tuned to the end, aren't you? Yeah, now you're going to stay tuned to the end. By the way, the first two are more important. Let me read a, a passage out of John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. This will set up saying yes to compassion and saying yes to unity. This is Jesus. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you. Wow, that's a high calling, isn't it? So he gives us what we're to do, and then he's given us the example. This is the command I give you, love one another. How are you supposed to do that? You're wondering about that? You're wrestling with that? Well, you're to do it in the same way that I've loved you. 
so you must love one another. By this, these are important words, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And here's the condition, if, if you love one another. So this implies that if we don't love one another, they won't know that we're his disciples. And I love those words, by this. Jesus, he's so clear. If, if you want people to know about me, if you want people to know that you walk with me, that you've been transformed by me and changed by me, by this, and, and I love, he gives us one thing, by this, your love for one another. You see how critical this is. That we say yes to compassion and we say yes to unity. So let's start by talking about saying yes to compassion. What is compassion? Well, last year we spent a whole year on this theme of compassion. So, so I'm guessing you're well versed on it. But just as a, some review. Compassion is entering the suffering of others. Being ready to help. Compassion is entering the suffering of others. Being ready to to help. And we serve a God who is a compassionate God. We serve a God who has taught us what it means to be compassionate because he saw us in our desperation, in our need, in our suffering, and he comes down and he enters our world ready to help. He's a compassionate God. I love the fact that our God doesn't ask us to do things that he hasn't already done. He has done this for us. He is a compassionate God, and he shows his compassion to us each and every day. In fact, there's this great story where the Lord appears before Moses the second time on the mountain. Moses had already gone up the mountain, got the Ten Commandments, but then he came down and found out that the people were, they lacked patience. They built a, a golden calf, and they began to worship it. Moses was so distraught by this, he drops the tablets and they shatter. But in an act of compassion, God wants to demonstrate his compassion, and so he calls Moses back up on the mountain. Right there, without even words, he's demonstrating that he's the God of compassion. And he leads Moses back up the mountain. He says, listen, I'm going to announce myself. And the Lord could have announced himself in an infinite number of ways but he chooses to announce himself in this way, which I think is is so critical. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, he says this. This is the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. This is the God that we serve, the God of compassion, the God of grace. How do you view God? You know, how you view God really matters. How we view our Father really matters. You see, if you have a view of God that he's always angry and upset at you, why would you want to spend any time with him? Your view of God really matters. Your relationship with him depends on your view of God. You see, if you think that God is just a scorekeeper, that matters. Because then you're just going to be living your, your whole life trying to make sure that the good things you do outweigh the bad things. Oh God, he's keeping score up there. That's my view. So, so I've, I've got to do everything I can to, to be perfect so that on that final day, when he looks at all the things, he considers all the things, the good will outweigh the bad. Or if we have a view of God like he's kind of a genie in a bottle or a Santa Claus type figure, that determines what our relationship with him will be like. We'll only go to him in times of need when we need a gift from him. Friends, I want to encourage all of us to view God in the way that he describes himself. He's the compassionate and gracious God. Compassionate. This is who he is. Therefore, in any trouble, in any circumstance, you can come to the Lord knowing that he's the God of compassion, that he's a God who is gracious. No matter the struggle, no matter the trouble, you can come to him because he is the God of compassion. You know, several years ago, 
We had this storm in New England. Many of you who live in New England remember this storm. It happened in October, a month like this, around this time, where all of a sudden we had this heavy snow. And all the leaves were still on the trees, and and the snow accumulated on the trees, and and all the limbs of the trees were bowing down to the ground, if you remember that. And they were snapping and, and falling and damaging many homes. And I remember for our house, a large limb fell in the backyard, right on top of our septic system. And so I I, I chopped up the tree and and got it out of the way, and it looked like everything was okay. Several weeks passed, and all of a sudden we looked out the back window, and we saw this like nine-foot hole in the back of our yard. It was our septic tank. It had cracked. And as soon as I looked at that, in my head, the first thing I thought about was, will this be covered by insurance? (laughs) Come to find out, Becca's first thought was, I'm so glad the kids didn't fall into the hole. And so I changed what my first thought was. My first thought was, I'm glad the kids didn't fall into the hole. But my, a, a close second was, will this be covered? And friends, I think we ask this question with the Lord too, and, and it's close cousin, will this be included? And we ask this of the Lord, Lord, does your compassion extend to me? Will it cover my hurt? Will it cover my trouble? Does your compassion, does your grace, does your mercy, does your presence apply to me? And and here's what I'd like to say to that. These are Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, he is, is, this is the Lord, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble. Now listen, friends, you do not need a seminary degree. You do not even need a commentary next to you to understand what this word all means. It means all, all. It leaves nothing out. And so the Lord is, he's the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble. And I love how the word of God teaches us that this is our God. He's the God of all compassion. He's the God who is gracious. But then the word of God calls us to be compassionate people. We're to reflect who our heavenly father is. We're to reflect Jesus, our, our savior. I wonder, how would your friends describe you right now? If I were to ask your friends, hey, tell me, tell me about Jim, tell me about Sarah, well, what words would they use to describe you? Would one of them be compassion? Or would one of them be love? They're, they're loving. Would they describe you as a person who abounds with compassion? Would compassion be in your title? Does it make the list, the list of acknowledgments? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, Uh, It's not as popular or as well-known as John 3.16, but I think it's just as good. 1 John 3.16 says this, We know what real love is. That's That's a great statement right there. You can know what real love is. How? Because Jesus gave up his life for us. This is how we know what real love is, because Jesus gave up his life for us. If you want to know what real love is, don't go to the bar. Go to the cross. If you want to know what real love is, go to the cross. Kneel and bow at the cross. See Jesus on the cross because he's there for you and for me, for our sins. This is what real love is, is that our God came down as one of us and he sacrificed his life for us. This is what real love is. And so as Christ followers, friends, we can know what real love is. The passage goes on and it says, so... We also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. I've told you this many times, but you know, you know, the Christian life is not the easiest life. It's swimming upstream, but it's the most fulfilling life. So also, we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. In verse 18, it says this: Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. I love that. Let's not just say, oh, yeah, 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 I love you, and then treat each other poorly. (laughs) Oh, no. No, let's say, man, I love you, and then let's show each other by our actions. Just as Christ 
died for us, gave his life for us. And friends, I believe it's through compassion and loving one another that our world is going to change. I believe it's through compassion that, that compassion is actually the answer today. It's the answer to your tough situation right now. With the person who's bugging you, compassion is the answer. With your neighbor who's struggling, compassion is the answer. With the person who disagrees with you, compassion is the answer. With the coworker who has said hateful things about you, compassion is the answer. With the friend who has not experienced the love of God, compassion is the answer. Into a broken world, compassion is the answer. Now, in this moment, you might be saying, well, listen, uh, man, if I say yes to compassion or, or if somebody's hurting, if, if I'm going to enter into the suffering of others, what could I possibly do? And sometimes I think what stops us from acting compassionately is ourselves, our self-doubt, our lack of confidence, which is really a lack of, of faith in what the Lord can do. I want to tell you, friends, really our role is simply saying yes and allowing the Lord to do the rest. That each and every one of you, if we would just turn our attention and listen to the Lord and ask him, Lord, what are you calling me to? Who are you calling me to, to bring your kind of compassion to? And when the Lord calls, if we would just simply say yes and put one foot in front of the other and start to go out, the Lord's going to meet us there and he's going to do a great thing. You might not feel equipped. You might not feel fully trained. But the Lord will train and equip you on the way. Let me share a quick story uh, that will maybe help encourage us in this. And it's, it's a story that's always hard for me to tell because it's an emotional story. But it's also a powerful story because of what God does through just a simple yes, even when we feel inadequate. Several years ago, I had a friend and his wife was going through a cancer battle. And it turns out that his wife passed away. The evening that she passed away, my friend called me and said, hey, I'd love for you to come over just to be with us. Now, I've gotten those kind of calls before as a pastor, but every time I get them, I think to myself, Lord, what could you possibly do through me? Lord, I need you. Come and fill me. I said yes to my friend right away because I knew that was the right thing to do. But to be honest with you, even as a pastor, I've been trained in this stuff, I felt ill-equipped. What could I possibly say into this scenario? What hope could I really bring? I was in my truck, and I was driving over to my friend's house, and I was, I was having this dialogue with the Lord, just saying that, that, that same stuff. Lord, what, what could you do? What, what can I do? What can I say? What are, what are the words that I need to bring? I know when I walk into that home, attention's going to be drawn to me. They're going to be looking to me to say something, to pray something, what is it, Lord? And the Lord just simply said, Brian, listen, I'll give it to you when you need it. <laughs> thanks. Oh, great. Thanks, Lord. That's fantastic. I got to the house, and um, I thought to myself, man, I wish I would have brought something. Becca's going to really be upset at me that I didn't bring anything. And, and I was looking around, and finally I was like, okay, let me see if there's anything in my truck. And I looked in the back seat, and I saw in the back seat th this old pink stuffed animal bunny rabbit. And to be honest, my first thought was, because I told my girls several times to clean out the back of my truck. I mean, this is a manly truck. There shouldn't be pink bunny rabbits in my truck, right? But in my truck, there's pink bunny rabbits and glitter. That's what's in my truck. I, I was so, initially I thought, I can't believe they didn't obey me. But then the Lord just said, Brian, that's what I want you to bring in. And so I grabbed the pink bunny rabbit. I looked at it. No wrapping, nothing. It was partially damaged. I'm like, all right, Lord, I'll bring it in. I walk into the home, which was a home filled with sorrow. My friend has two daughters about my kid's age. And I, and I saw them there. And we walked in. I spent some time. He was there. His, his, his parents were there. Her parents were there. And um, it was a home filled with sorrow. Finally, I, I looked at his youngest daughter, and, and I still had this pink bunny rabbit in my hand, and, and I went to her and I said, hey, I, I brought this for you. And I handed it to her. 
Have you ever received one of those hugs from a kid where, where they squeeze your legs so hard, so strong, you think you're going to topple over? She hadn't said anything to me yet, but she came over and she, she clung to my legs so hard, I almost thought I was going to topple over. And then she let go and she went on her way. That night we prayed together and, and then I left. I didn't know the significance of that moment until the next day. My friend called me and said, hey, Brian, I couldn't get the words out, but I got to tell you that when you gave that pink bunny rabbit to my daughter, my wife would give her a pink bunny rabbit on her birthday every year. In fact, we call her as a nickname, Bunny. For her, that was just a last gift from her mom. And it was the Lord saying to her, I'm with you. It's going to be okay. For me, it was an upset gift because my kids left it in the back of my truck. But to the Lord, it was a powerful way to reveal that he was with her. Friends, I wonder, what's in your hand? What do you have? And will you give it to the Lord? What we can do is we can say yes. So who is the Lord calling you to act compassionately towards? And will you say yes? Second thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about saying yes to unity. You know, when I think about unity, I think the, the best picture for me is of a marching band. Now, there are two kinds of marching bands. I was in a marching band in high school. This is not the kind of marching band I'm talking about. My marching band, about 10% of the band knew the music. I did not fall in that 10%, if you were wondering. None of us had a full uniform because, I don't know, our school couldn't afford it or something. And when we came down through a parade and we had to go around a corner, it was like a tractor trailer that had gone out of control. And all women, children, and, and men and women, and adults, and kids had to beware because they could be taken out at any moment. We were all out of step, and it was a disaster. <laughs> but if you look at a different marching band, if you look at the Texas Southern University Ocean of Soul marching band, I'd encourage you to YouTube it later today, you will see something drastically different. Not only do they all know the music, but there are pyrotechnics, there are acrobatics, and there is rocking music that gets every toe tapping that's listening to it. I love this picture of a marching band because in unity, they do something that's so powerful. It's a powerful experience. Yet, they're all playing different instruments. There are different sections of the band. Oftentimes, they're marching in different directions. But put together, the full picture is a picture of great unity. Now, what would happen if just one of the sections was out there? You'd be missing the fullness of the piece of music. You'd be missing the fullness of the artistic expression. And what if just one section of the Christian body was marching? You'd be missing the expression of Jesus Christ, the full expression of Jesus. I love this picture because it, it displays Christian unity, all gifted in different ways, marching together to the same cadence of the Spirit, powerfully revealing the love of Jesus together. My question is this, in this, is are we marching together, church? Right now, in 2020 of October, October of 2020, are we as church marching together? And maybe to get more personal with each and every one of us, are you in step? Are you in step? You see, what makes the Texas Southern University Ocean of Soul Marching Band able to march in step is that they all have music that they, they know by, by heart and they play the music. And they're also able to stay in step because there's a drum line that sets a cadence for them. And they march to that cadence. Do you know we have a cadence as well? We have a cadence as well. And to be honest with you, friends, as your pastor, I think in this moment it would be really easy to enter some things into our cadence that don't belong there. And maybe we're even marching to the wrong cadence. 
And so right now, I, I want to give you as clearly and concisely as I possibly can what our cadence is. Because we need the cadence to know what we're uniting around and how we're to met, march so that we, we can know with confidence that we're in step with one another. Do you know the truth is our cadence? And unity happens when we align with and when we apply the truth of God's word. I want to share some of the truth with you as clearly and as concisely as I can. And I'm hoping that this will be an experience and an exercise for us to realign and to recommit to applying the truth so that we can walk and march together. The truth is this, is that we were created by God in the image of God. We were created by God in the image of God. Therefore, every human being that you look at is a creation of God, made in the image of God, and should be treated as such. The truth is, is that we were created to worship God. This is our great purpose. Not only were we created by God in the image of God, but we were created to worship God. This is why we're here, to bring glory to the Lord. Not to bring glory or focus on our kingdoms, but to bring glory to God. The truth is, is that all of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Not one of us has lived a perfect life. And Paul says this in Romans 3, verse 23, for everyone has sinned. Everyone. Therefore, we should be, be humble with one another because we've all failed. We've all missed the mark. But the truth is this, is that love compelled God to rescue us. Praise God. For God so loved the world. It's out of his love that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He's rescued us. The truth is that in Jesus, we are a new creation. We should be saying amen to that. <laughs> I've seen some of you before your new created selves. Praise God. In Jesus, you are a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. The truth is, is that we have been given a great mission. We're not a people without a mission. We are a people on mission. And our mission, I love in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. This is our mission. Our mission, friends, let me remind you, is to be witnesses, to be, bear witness of Jesus Christ. This is our mission. It's of higher priority than anything else. We are to bear witness of the work and the love and, 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 and the presence of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our mission. The truth is that God wants us to accomplish this mission together. The truth is that we need the filling of the Spirit to do so. Look at that Acts chapter 1 again. It says, but you will receive power when... The Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is the truth, is that we need a fresh filling of the Spirit. The truth is that in this life there will be trouble. We live in a broken world. We long, our hearts groan for the return of Jesus Christ. But until then, we will see and experience brokenness. But our role in this is not to... to, to move our identities to associate with the brokenness. It's to stay firm and grounded and rooted in our identity in the Lord, in where we're headed, not where we are. And the truth is this, friends, that in Jesus, there is victory. In this world, this is Jesus speaking, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. My question for us in this moment is, are we marching together? Are we marching together? Are we treating one another as image bearers of the Lord? Are we marching together? Are, are we focusing on bringing worship and glory to God? Are we worshiping together? Are we recognizing that we all need to repent? We all fall short. Are, are, are we marching together? Are we praising the Lord because of his love for us that, 
that he's rescued us? Are we operating in our new creation or our old creation? Are we marching together? Are we trying to fulfill and and achieve and go after our mission to be witnesses of Jesus Christ? Are we marching together? Are we eagerly waking every morning and saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit? Are we marching together? Are we working and moving and living in this broken world to bring light into darkness? Are we marching together? Do we have this instilled hope within us and joy within us, knowing that our Jesus is victorious? Are we marching together? Friends, are you in step? You know, as you're in your groups um, this week, and if you're not a part of a group, I encourage you to, to join one. You can do that by visiting our website. We've been going through the book on the other side of Yes. It's a new author. He's all right. You can uh, judge for yourself. Um, I, I want you to pick up one of these books, and um, partially because all the proceeds, when you buy it today, go to um, feed those in our community and to our food bank. And so I'd love for people to, to buy them. If you've bought one, buy two. And um, we want to keep feeding the hungry in our midst. But this week, we're going to be concentrating around unity, compassion and unity. And and in the chapter, chapter 9, I talk about nine ways, nine commitments that we need to make in order to realize the kind of unity that Jesus prays for in John 17. I want you to read through that, pray about those things, and then discuss them in your groups. Let me give you some concluding thoughts. You know, friends, as one of your lead pastors, I see it as my responsibility to teach the gospel. This is my priority, is to teach the gospel and to teach the word of God. I also see part of my role as drawing people to Jesus, continually drawing all of us to Jesus. I also see it as part of my role to provide guidance to the church as we follow Jesus together. And so I just wanted to take two more minutes to talk about the church as we approach the election. Three things that I want to share with you that speak into this season with the election fast approaching. The first thing I want to say is I do want to encourage you to vote. I want to encourage you to to vote. I want to encourage you to, you know, use your right uh, to vote. I think that would be a good thing. Secondly, and more importantly, I want to remind you to pray. I want to remind you to pray. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2, when you read about it, when you read it, it calls us, commands us to pray for those who are placed in leadership positions. So if we're going to be church, that's what we are going to do, no matter who wins. Right now, we have a president. We pray for him. January 1st, whoever that president is, we pray for them. That's what we do. That's what church does. We pray. We can pray for the Spirit of God to come into that Oval Office. We can pray that our leaders bow their knees to Jesus. We can pray that our leaders turn to the Lord and and, and seek the Lord's wisdom. We pray. We pray. This is what church does. The third thing I want to say is this. Uh, First was I want to encourage you to vote. The second was I want to remind you to pray. And the third is this, is I want to assure you that our king is on his throne. Our king is on his throne. Now and forevermore, Jesus is our king, and he is on his throne. You know, I was reminded this week by the chairman of our elder board, that many people, when Jesus walked this earth, many people missed him. Many people missed that the Messiah was right in their presence. And why did they miss it? Because their focus was somewhere else. Their focus was on fixing their government or, or, or a military leader coming in. Their focus was so huge and, and, and so concentrated in another place that the Messiah walked right by him. And they missed him. Let's not do the same. Jesus is in our midst. He's working and he's moving. And I want to charge us, friends, as we're assured that he's on his throne, that that he has victory, that the Lord is in control. I want to commend us and charge us to focus all of our hearts 
on what Jesus is wanting to do in and through us. This is where our allegiance is to Jesus. So friends, how do we do this? We say yes to him when he calls. And so I pray that we would be a people in this moment, a church in this moment, that would say yes to compassion, that would say yes to unity. And on the other side of our yes, we would see mountains moved. Not for the kingdom of this world, but for the kingdom of God. I pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.